Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. Today's episode is brought to you by the West Tennessee Delta Heritage Center, home of the Tina Turner Museum. Okay, before we get started with today's very special guest, Eric, I want to hear something that you have discovered this week at Discovery Park of America. What I've discovered this week at uh, Discovery Park of America is our pollinator garden in the back. So it is very full right now. The flowers are showing. You can go over there and see all that as well as we have some wild plums actually starting to grow back there and they're starting to ripen up and everything like that. I have not seen the wild plums, but I did last year cut some of the heads off the zinnias, and I planted them at my house, and I also have zin- I have Discovery Park zinnias all over my yard now. So it is beautiful out there, and the, you can hear the bees buzzing and the, everything pollinating as it's supposed to, and we're getting ready to open up our new greenhouse, so we're going to keep doing a lot of that. So um, that's exciting. So today's very special guest is author Brad Barton. He's a minister, an author, a traveler. We're going to hear all about his life and what's inspired him to write his books. Welcome, Brad. Thank you. It's great to be here. I appreciate you having me, Scott. So I know you, you uh, we're going to talk a little bit about your youth and your childhood. I know at some point you end up in Dallas, which I spent a lot of time in Fort Worth in high school. So um, I'm anxious to hear about that. Where were you born? I was born in Sturgis, Michigan, which is kind of in the center part of the state, right on the Indiana border. And when I was somewhere between two and three years old, my family moved down to the Dallas, Texas area. And I spent my the rest of my childhood and youth down in Dallas and uh, spent actually all of my life in Texas until I met my wife, Susan, who is from this part of the country. And she is the person who introduced me to this area. Oh, fantastic. So what did your uh, parents do for a living? Well, that is an interesting story. They're both entrepreneurs. My father, he played a part in inventing those metallic balloons that you see floating around um, just all over the place, I guess, at birthday parties and floral bouquets, that kind of thing. He has a, a longer history than that. He was a packaging engineer who had an entrepreneurial spirit, and he invented those, and he started his own company, and he made balloons for most of the time that I was a teenager and into my early adulthood. And my mother was a real estate agent who decided to start a group of, uh, of companies, um, I guess you would call it, where she was selling residential real estate and had agents who worked with her and for her. And um, so so both my parents are very entrepreneurial. Well, that, that's interesting. So do you recall when he said, hey, I have an idea I'm working on? Um, because as a kid, you know, all kids love balloons. So that must have been an exciting day. Yeah, it's interesting. I don't think he came home and, and told us that. Um, he worked at a place that was 20 or 30 miles away from where we lived, and he would take us there on the weekends because he was the plant manager, and then he was the president of the company, and they made explosives. And I thought that was pretty cool. And it was because of the, the packaging of the explosives was very similar to the types of films that they used to make the balloons. Um, so I don't remember him coming home one day and saying, gosh, I'm going to switch from making explosives to making balloons. But what I do remember is that for a couple of years of my life, we had balloons of various shapes and sizes. Usually they look more like pillows than round because he used um, straight line heat sealers. And so there were these floating pillows around my house for a couple of years during my childhood while he was trying to get the formula just right. And then um he obviously did eventually. And um, did he uh, stay in the balloon business? Is he, st- is, is, is he still alive? And He is still alive. He stayed in the balloon business until um, I don't know how many people know that there was a helium shortage toward the end of, I guess they call it the aughts, but 2000 to 2010. And then around 2008, there was an economic collapse. And in the midst of all of that, his company ended up going out of business. Mm. And what does he do today? Oh, today he's retired. When you walk around with him like at uh, Disney or whatever and he sees balloons, does he say, you know, I invented that. That's a 4073 balloon. (laughs) That's funny because uh, 
no, we don't talk about it. I, I don't know why. It, when I was a kid, I remember every time there was a balloon in a parade, everyone in the family would gather around the television. We'd say, look, there's a balloon, there's a balloon. And, and now we just don't talk about it. I mean, even <laughs> as I was a teenager, I, I never got a balloon as a present that I can recall because they were ubiquitous at our house. I mean, they were just everywhere. And we all, except for my mom, who had her own thing, we were all working in the company. And as a result of that, they became just everyday items for us. You know, the cobbler's children have no shoes. So I guess that's, that's, right. that, that's how it applied. So uh, what did you major in when you went off to college? I went off to the University of Texas and I majored in business. I had three different, uh, three different areas of emphasis and one was marketing, one was management and one's a little bit hard to explain. So uh, yeah. And then I got my MBA right out of uh, undergraduate and I primarily emphasized marketing and, uh, and entrepreneurship. Um, I wanted to follow in my parents' footsteps, obviously. I wanted to be able to have a manufacturing company. I really wanted to manufacture board games. Oh, that's interesting. You're a game player? I was very much a game player when I was a kid. I loved card games. I loved board games. I loved video games, although they were just starting to become a thing. Nothing like what they have, you know, what they are today. Um, I was really interested in board games and dominoes, and I even started collecting antique dominoes around the time that I was in high school. I was so interested in them. And for many, many years, my desire was to to learn the ropes in business by working for another company for a while and then start a game manufacturing company. Oh, that's interesting. So, But somewhere along the way, you took a detour. Yes, I took a huge detour back in the late 1990s. I think 1999 was the year that I went to seminary. I'm actually writing a book right now about the events that led to that because I was really struggling to discern whether or not I was being called to ministry. And I asked God one night to send me a dream to help me figure this out once and for all. And I actually received three dreams that made it very clear what I was supposed to do. Um, I had just recently gotten married to Susan, who was already planning on entering seminary. And that's when I started kind of discerning my call. And in these dreams, I found out with absolute certainty that I was supposed to leave the business world and go into ministry. And that shocked my parents like you can't believe. Um, it, it was just, it was wild. Uh, I know that there's a phrase out there about when you tell someone some news and they fall off their chair. I remember my father sitting in my living room and I told him that I was no longer going to be a businessman. I was no longer going to be an entrepreneur. I was going to go into ministry. And he literally fell off the chair that he was sitting on. I'd never seen that happen before. Now, did you grow up uh, in church? I did. I grew up in church. Uh, we were in a Methodist church for a while. Then something happened in that congregation, and we, we searched around for another church in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and we settled in on, I didn't know at the time that it was an independent Christian church, but that's what it was, and it shares some heritage with the denomination that I serve in, which is the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. And it was that congregation that really formed me. And I was always I was always searching for something like that congregation. It was called Valley View Christian. And that's how I ended up in the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, coupled with the reality that Susan was seeking ordination in the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. And that's where she was uh, going when y'all met, like in that denomination? Yes, she was actually working in a church when I, I met her. I went into a church for the very first time. And um, this was in 1995. I walked into the building and the first person who greeted me was this young lady. And uh, we just started talking. And then the next week I went back and we started talking again. And I found out that that was her very last Sunday. She was going back at, uh, back to Fort Worth to complete her senior year in college. And I was in San Antonio, Texas. Oh, so no. we started dating and we lived five hours apart. And then the, the Saturday after she graduated from college, we got married. Oh, wow. That's a great story. Yeah, um, really. It was a lot of fun. So you, you went back and forth, obviously. Um, and then did you both go to the same seminary? Yes, together? we went to Christian Theological Seminary in Indianapolis, Indiana together for two years. We had a child at that point, and um, for a variety of reasons having to do with, with finding it to be a struggle with the way that their course schedule was set up um, for both of us to graduate, being married and having a child, needing to find child care. We ended up finishing our seminary at uh, Texas Christian University. They have a seminary called Bright Divinity School, and that's where we finished up. 
So um, my dad uh, went to Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary while I was in high school. So, um, Oh, wow. Have, yeah, one of my professors at Bright was from Southwestern. So, yeah, I'm familiar with him. Yeah, I have very fond memories. All my friends in in there during that phase from ninth grade to twelfth grade were either seminary students' kids or professors' kids. So wow. uh, we were a rowdy bunch, as you can imagine. But <laughs> Um, a very, very fun time of life. Um, so uh, that's interesting. You've got two ministers in the family. Um, how do you decide what happens once you graduate? Uh, where did God lead the two of you? That is an excellent question. Um, Susan never really anticipated that her call was in a congregational setting at first. And so she was anticipating that she was being called to chaplaincy. And she actually did end up going into chaplaincy. And for the past, um, like, almost 20 years, she's largely been a chaplain. And then I got sick sometime around 2009, which caused a short blip in those plans. I have a chronic illness. And while we were trying to get that straightened out, she needed to um, figure out what she was going to do next. And so she got a taste of some congregational ministry. But then after about two years of that, for the next decade, she was uh, a chaplain again at a hospital in Grand Junction. Well, I got sick again uh, about three years ago. My my chronic illness, it, it flared up, that's what they call it, and it became time for us to do something different. She was getting um, worn out from, from chaplaincy. She was a palliative care chaplain, and that's very difficult. She's working with dying people every single day, and uh, so we just decided to take a little bit of a break. And so, I, you know, to answer your question directly about how do we decide, I don't think we do. Somehow it's always just worked out that that when one of us was going to get sick or when one of us needed to go in a different direction, God led us in the direction we needed to go. And about how old was your kid about this time? Which one? Which time? Oh, so you had more you had more kids when you when you uh, uh, got sick and uh, we're trying to figure that out. Did you okay, have more so than yeah, how many did you have? We now have two kids. Um, okay. They're they're both adults at this point. So when when I first got sick in 2009, one of my kids was I'm doing the math in my head, 11 years old, and the other one was seven years old. Gotcha. And so then we moved from we were in Missouri all the way up until that time. We've been been serving in Missouri all the way up until I got sick. And then when Susan needed to look for um, a place to get called to, we ended up in Colorado. And we spent the next decade and a half in Colorado. When I got sick again, uh, both of the boys were out of school and they had made a decision to join the Air Force. And so they're both in the Air Force right now. Um, one of them is up in Maryland and the other one is in Nebraska. Well, that's interesting. So your whole, you guys don't mind traveling. Traveling around, living other places is uh, part of your life. It is part of our life. My oldest son, wow, he really got the brunt of it because he had moved several times before the youngest was born. And he he still likes to call Texas home. He was born in Texas, but he really feels like he never got a chance to settle in anywhere. We feel kind of bad about that, um, even though we did live in, in Grand Junction for almost 10 years. So so I hope that, that during his high school years, he got to settle in there some, because uh, that's Grand Junction, Colorado. But yeah, we, we move around a lot. And so then we decided in 2020, um, and this was right before COVID started, we had taken a little trip to Moab, Utah, Susan and I, and we decided that we were going to buy a trailer, a little teeny tiny trailer, uh, five foot by eight foot. And we were going to make a plan to, within the next year and a half, travel around the country, leave our jobs and and just travel for as long as we could and and enjoy the country and give ourselves a chance to, you know, recuperate some and hopefully try to get my chronic illness under control. So in the spring of 2021, we did just that. We quit our jobs, we left, and we spent nine months traveling around the United States in a uh, Subaru Outback and a trailer that is five feet by eight feet, and you can't stand up in it, you can barely sit. So we call it a bed on wheels. When you're mapping out, like, the places you're going to go, you know, ha, ha, t talk talk me through because someday when I retire, that's something like I would want to do. Talk <laughs> me through how you select the route and how far in advance do you pick where you're going to go, or you just jump in and take off. 
I have, that is an excellent question. I had all these plans made on where we were going to do. I, did, I started watching videos of other people who did what we did, and I watched the places that they were at, and that started giving me ideas of what I wanted to do. So I made all these plans. I, even, I put together a spreadsheet of where we were going to be at every point in time, and we didn't do any of it. Um, <laughs> That's what I would do. <laughs> <laughs> the reasons are many, but ultimately we ended up picking several parts of the country that we wanted to have as kind of like bases and it had to do with where family was because working as hard as we had worked we didn't get to see family for you know very frequently for a long period of time so we ended up saying you know what we're going to spend some time centered around my family in the dallas fort worth area we're going to spend some time centered around susan's family in the st louis missouri area and the family farm that my family has up in south central michigan and then, so, so really getting to an answer to your question, we also had our kids on opposite coasts. One was in California at the time and one was at Maryland. So we had time set up to see family and we had one other event that we wanted to get to and we had to put together our travel plans around that. So it was basically make lines between point A, point B, point C, point D, point E and figure out the timing and then just look for state parks and national parks that are in between. And that that's how we decided where to travel. What was your, uh, when you look back, what was your favorite uh, place to stay? Probably uh, Port, it's okay, let me think. I think the area is called Port Huron, but I'm not 100%. It's up in the thumb of Michigan. It's on Lake Huron. And it was both the most beautiful, peaceful place of all the places that we stayed. And it's where something that felt like a little miniature hurricane cropped up and in about a half an hour destroyed a big part of our setup. But it was still very beautiful. <laughs> wow. And so um, you would stay like how long approximately? Would Did it vary how long you would stay at each spot? That's uh, also an excellent question. If you stay at national park campgrounds and state park campgrounds, there's almost a universal in our country rule that you can't stay more than 14 days in one place. Hmm. So that would usually put a time frame. If we really wanted to stay in one area and get to know it, we would use the entire 14 days. If we wanted to move around some and get to another area, or if we had to move so that we could get closer to a family member in a particular time frame, then, then we would stay shorter. But we tried to stay up to 14 days in one spot because moving required a fair bit of effort. Moving days were always challenging. You've got to put everything up and uh, hitch things up and, and just, there's a lot of work to do on a moving day. So we try to minimize the moving days, but also the reason that we only traveled for nine months instead of two years, which was our original plan is because the price of gas had gotten so high during that time frame. As a result of the high price of gas, the last thing I wanted to do was pull the trailer any more than I had to because it cut our mileage by at least half. So we could drive the car without the trailer and get a lot more miles per gallon than if we're pulling the trailer. So we, we try to minimize that. That's another reason why we didn't see as much of the country as I originally anticipated. Gas just got so expensive. And so gas got expensive and you needed to turn the page to another chapter. Uh, what happened next? Susan, she thought it would take her a while to get an interim ministry position, which is where she's serving someplace for a relatively short period of time. I was writing books at this point, and, and I was publishing books at this point. So Susan was looking for something that would make us some money and keep us a little bit stable while I continued writing books. She got an interim job in southwest Missouri at a little community called Ash Grove, and we spent nine months there. Then we traveled for another three months. We, we thought, okay, this has actually worked pretty well. We can work for nine months. We can travel for three months. And maybe there's a way that we could keep this going. So now she is in a position where it is more stable. She has more than a one-year contract. And she works nine months out of the year. And we have three months of travel each year. So that's, that's where we are. And when we're not traveling, I write. When we're traveling, we travel. So um, I'm going to... Uh dive more into your writing and, and how that came to be. But we're going to take a quick break and we're going to do that as soon as we get back.
Inside, visitors can learn about the history of cotton, explore the scenic and wild Hatchie River, and get to know the legendary musician who called West Tennessee home. Also located on the ground is Flag Grove School, the childhood school of Tina Turner and the last home of blues pioneer Sleepy John Estes. To learn more about the center, visit westtennesseeheritage.com. I hope you're enjoying the Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a positive review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. This is your host, Scott Williams, and today our guest is Brad Barton, who is um, a lot of things, but we're going to talk right now about his um, writing and how he was first inspired to begin writing. A lot of people, Brad, I found, I hear it all the time, um, um, oh, I want to write a book, you know, or I am writing a book, or, you know, so tell us a little bit about what was your inspiration uh, to start writing. Sure. My inspiration to start writing was uh, probably goes back to third grade. When I was in third grade, I can remember um, really enjoying the time that our teacher gave us to write. And I didn't know it at the time, but at the end of the year, they were going to publish, our teacher was going to publish into a book, all of the stories that we wrote during the course of that year. And when it came time to see the results of those books, my book was like three or four times thicker than any other kid's book. And there's a reason for that. We were allowed to, to write just whatever we wanted to as soon as we finished our assignments. And I liked writing so much that I would, I would work on my actual schoolwork so fast that it was unreadable. My handwriting was so bad because I was going at such a, such a fast pace so that I could get to that time where I could write some stories. That's really when I knew that, that writing was something that I really wanted to be a part of me. It also then showed up again when I was in college and in graduate school, um, whenever we would have to, to write a paper and other people were struggling, if the page limit was say, or the page minimum was 10 pages, people would say, oh my gosh, I can't get more than three or four pages. And I would say, I've got to cut mine down from 50 pages to the page <laughs> maximum because I just like writing so much. Um, then around 2008 to 2009, Susan got this story idea based on the church bell tower where she grew up in Dexter, Missouri. At the First Christian Church in Dexter, Missouri, there's this bell tower, and she and her best friend, they used to spend time climbing up into it. And when we would go back and, and visit her home church, which is where we got married, and it's where our kids were, were dedicated, and one of our kids was baptized, um, I, I was really mesmerized by that bell tower as well. Well, she started writing a little story. Um, I think she had it in her mind that it was going to be a full-blown novel about these two boys who who traveled into stories of the bell tower, um, traveled into stories of the Bible through this bell tower at First Christian Church in Dexter. She got two pages into the story and she gave up on it. She couldn't figure out what to do more than just the two pages that she had put down. <laughs> well, me being able to write 50 to 100 pages where somebody else is comfortable writing two pages, I said, hey, do you mind if I, I noticed you haven't worked on this in a while. Would you mind if I, if I took that idea and maybe I, I gave it a stab? And she said, sure, go ahead. So very quickly, I wrote about half of the first book, and then it just sat there. And over the course of the next 10 years, I would add to it. I would show it to our youngest son, who at the time was in the target audience age range. And finally, about five or six years in, I finished the book. And it was another five years until I finally ended up publishing the book because I had a manuscript, but I did not know what to do with it. Did you... Um, think about uh, sending it to publishers and get an agent and all that, or did you jump right into self-publishing? Well, during that five years that I didn't do anything with it, I thought a lot about getting an agent. I thought about working with our denominations, um, publishing house, which is called Chalice Press. And I even talked to regional ministers and different people who I knew who, who could make those connections for me. And it just never really went anywhere. I would pitch the idea to people. I mean, I'd already written the book, and so I could tell them all about it. And everyone seemed interested, but I would never get callbacks from, from the publishing houses. I didn't know anything about agents, that kind of thing. Um, then all of a sudden, when we decided to, to leave everything else behind, I, I did 
failed to mention that we sold basically everything that we had before we hit the road because we could only take with us what we could put in our car and a tiny trailer. So oh, I was left. I was curious about that. If you guys had a home base where you kept all your garbage that we all accumulate um, after twenty or so years, um, or did you? So you sold everything. You really just you cleaned house. We tried our best to clean house. There are certain things that we just couldn't get rid of, mementos with our kids, things that nobody else would care about that we do. We still own a piece of property, not a house, but a piece of property with a storage unit on it, a storage shed in the desert of Western Colorado. And so we do keep some things there, but you know, it's it's very, very minimal. There's, there's not a lot. And hopefully one of these days we'll get most of that back over on, on this side of the mountains. But going back and crossing those mountains, it's just a, it's a long, yeah, it's it's very far from here, and and going over the mountains isn't easy. So, so we just don't go back much. Um, so, getting back to the the story, I I tried to seek an agent and all of that. I actually paid an independent editor to edit the book, and I got a lot of feedback. But I just never really knew where to get started with with a publisher. And I had a full-time job, a more than full-time job being a pastor of a congregation. And so I didn't have a lot of time to give to that. Well, once we were on the road, I had nothing but time, but I didn't have a lot of internet access or that kind of thing. So self-publishing just made a lot of sense. I watched a lot of a lot of uh, video workshops, a lot of YouTube videos, trying to figure out what the best route was going to be in the publishing industry had changed so much by 2021 that I felt pretty comfortable self-publishing. And really the writing and publishing part for me has been very easy. It's the marketing part, which somebody with a background in marketing um, should be pretty good at. Marketing today is nothing like it was 20 plus years ago when I was last in marketing and it's, it's taken me a while to figure this out. So did you self-publish through Kindle KDP? Yes, I did. That's exactly how I did it. Yeah, that's great. And there's, I mean, there's a whole subculture of folks who do what you're doing. And, you know, the kind of books that I publish are typically biographies that take years to actually research and write. Um, <clears throat> but what they say that I hear that you're doing that I'm wanting to hear more about is that if you publish a series, that it's more yes. effective because people will start to read and then they'll want to keep buying your books. Um, is that what you have found to be the case? I have found that to be the case. Now that I'm four books in, so I've published four books already, people do seem to take me a little bit more seriously. And that's actually why I haven't put a lot of effort into the marketing part of it yet, because I wanted to get enough books in to where I really felt like I had something to sell. If I can, if I can promote my, if I can put out an ad, let's say on Amazon and say, hey, there's four books in the series, then it has a lot more clout than I've written the first book in the series and I promise I'm going to write more and people don't really believe that. Um, so, so yes, people do take it more seriously now that I've got four and I plan on having a limitless um, future number of future editions in the series, even as I write other works. Now, I, I understand that you and your wife had a podcast back when you were traveling. Um, yes. Did, talk, talk me through a little bit of what the inspiration for that was and, and what you discovered while doing it. Okay. As we were, tra as we prepared to travel, as I mentioned, we watched YouTube videos of other people who had done what, what we were getting ready to do. And many of them were both video and audio podcasts that you could download using, you know, whatever podcast software you happen to have or whatever podcast listener. I don't know the lingo, but uh, we had decided we're going to make videos of our journey and we're going to try to make money that way. Well, it turns out that making videos while you're traveling around and doing what you're doing is really, really, really difficult. You got to know what you're doing and you've got to commit a lot of resources to it. And neither of us was really in a place where we felt like committing those kinds of resources. But what yeah, we also, did be also, if you're traveling and you're going to these beautiful places and you're hiking and going, I mean, the last thing I would want to do is pull out the camera and start recording and talking and making sure my hair is right. And, you know, so, you know, I would, I would just chunk all that and want to sit by the fire and read. Exactly. And that's kind of what we were, that that's where we were. I've got to say, I have so much respect for the people who 
do what we did and actually record it because it is so much more difficult. I mean, if you can imagine watching someone um, do a difficult trail climb, for example, and you're watching video footage of that person doing that climb, they have to do it once while they're being recorded. Then they have to go back down and get their equipment and do it again. And it just makes everything so much more difficult. So we just, we knew that we weren't really into that. But what we could do is we had a nice enclosed space in our trailer where we could record. And we had all of the gear that we had intended to use that included both video and audio. So we decided, you know what, let's just go ahead. And when we have some downtime at a campground, let's record something interesting that happened during the last week. Or let's tell some stories about what's happened so far during our travels. And we started the Explore Blog Net podcast. I should say that it helped that we already had an exploreblog.net website. We don't anymore. But we had this website where for many years we had been writing articles just about being explorers of the world around us. Even when we lived in Grand Junction, Colorado, um, when we had a few days off, like weekend days, we were not content just to sit in one spot. We were always exploring and hiking and trying to see what's out there over the horizon. That's just it's kind of who we are. So um, a lot of people... Um want to do some of the things that you're doing, writing, traveling, uh, getting rid of all the garbage that we accumulate. Um, sure. what, what's, what's been your inspiration to, why are you pulling the trigger and making it happen? Whereas other people just sit around and wish they could. That I hadn't thought about like what separates us from the people who sit back and think about it. One thing that I can tell you that made it possible for us is that we sat down together, the two of us, and we talked about it and we came up with a three-year plan. I was on a sabbatical back in 2018 and Susan needed to go to, a, we were in Western Colorado, Susan needed to go to a conference in St. Louis, Missouri. And so the two of us had that time to drive from Western Colorado to St. Louis, Missouri, which is about a 16 hour drive. And during that drive, we had what I'll call the conversation, which was, yeah, we need to we need to get out there and we need to travel. How can we make this possible? And so I think the the important thing is just talking about it with your spouse, talking about it with your partner. I mean, whoever it is who you're going to be doing this travel thing with, sit down, talk about it, commit to it, and then make a plan. And in that moment in 2018, we made a three-year plan. And almost nothing went according to that plan. But guess what? In three years, we were on the road. Yeah. And, you know, I guess God knew what he was doing, putting the two of you together, because in a lot of cases you might have, you know, a husband who would be willing to do that or a wife who would be will. But the two of you together being willing to do that um, is a really important part of that. Yeah, that is so important. And we were both shocked. I mean, it's one of those situations where we're in the car, we're driving, we're just talking about how beautiful it is to drive through the mountains in Colorado. And both of us almost at exactly the same time said, you know what, let's let's put our jobs, let's drop everything and spend as much time as we can discerning what God wants us to do next. And it's like we, we both said the exact same words at the exact same time. And for us, that's how we've always known that that's God directing us to do something is when we both have the same discernment of the same thing at the same time and that every big shift in our our married life together has been precipitated by something like that so i guess if you say what's the inspiration for it the answer is we're both looking to god and we're getting our i guess our marching orders if you want to call them that i know it's a military analogy but we're getting our marching orders from someone other than ourselves and it just so happens that we were told it's time to pick up and go do something different and we said okay and, and we had done that before. When, when we left San Antonio, Texas and went to Indianapolis for seminary, we had to get rid of everything that we owned. We, we were moving into married housing. We were, married, we were moving into an apartment that was so married housing that was furnished. We couldn't take anything with us. And so we, we left our jobs. We left our, you know, our livelihood and all of our stuff. It's something that we had done before. And so we're, we're used to giving up everything that we have and, and following God's call. I do have to say that it was much easier to do without kids than it would have been to do if we had kids in the house. I, I really don't know with our limited resources what we would have done if we felt this call while we had kids in the house. Somehow we would have needed a more expensive trailer, a bigger trailer, and a bigger tow vehicle. I don't know how we'd have done it, but you know, God didn't call us to do it then. So 
where, where we weren't listening back at that time, but, but <laughs> when we were listening and when God was calling, um, everything worked out. So uh, tell me, what are you, what are you uh, two doing now, today? So today we live in Kennett, Missouri, and Susan is the pastor of First Christian Church in Kennett, Missouri. So down in the Boot Hill, not very far from, from you all, we're, we do have a membership to Discovery Park. Everywhere we go, everywhere we live, we try to find a place that's about an hour away from where we live, where we can become members so we can just go there to escape anytime we want. And we were driving back from seeing one of our sons, and we drove through Kentucky and then through Tennessee, and we saw Discovery Park off in the distance. And I remember it was my birthday, and I was talking to my sister on the phone. She was calling me to wish me happy birthday. And I saw this place. I said, Kimberly, that's my sister. I have to stop you for a second. And I turned to Susan. And I said, what is that? <laughs> and, and so we spent the next month trying to figure out everything we could about what Discovery Park was. And so, so what do we do? We, uh, we work, you know, during the week. For nine months out of the year, we travel three months out of the year. My wife serves a church. I write books, and I do my best to to try to publish and promote those books. And I we have some hobbies and other things that we do, but but that's what we do. And then in our spare time, we go to Discovery Park. There's a in in uh, in Arkansas. There's a little theater that we like in Paragould, Arkansas, uh, called the Collins Theater, and we try to go and see as many things there as we can. But we just we go hiking whenever we get an opportunity to go, to go hiking. I'm learning how to play the banjo, which um, I, I'm a bit of a musician. I'm, I'm not good at any musical instrument, but I play a lot of different musical instruments. And so I'm, I'm trying to learn how to play the banjo uh, because we started when we went to Discovery Park or not Discovery Park, sorry, the Collins Theater. Um, we started watching these bluegrass things and these people are always playing a banjo. And I thought, wow, I've wanted to play a banjo for a long time. So now I play banjo. Um, kind of, and that, that's just what we do. We, yeah, we've been we working work on, have- you know, we have a celebration of David Crockett's birthday and we've been trying to figure out how can we make that more, uh, fun and exciting and what, you know, what can we add to like, you know, we have blacksmiths and, you know, people who are doing, you know, early Tennessee, uh, settler type, type crafts and, and skills and things like that. So we've been playing around with the idea of having more bluegrass as a part of that event. So, um, we'll have to make sure you're aware of that so you can bring your banjo, um, and, uh, play for that. So, um, anyway, that's coming up, but just, uh, the, the moment that you had when you came around the corner and saw this Discovery Park, I can vouch yep. that that still is the feeling you have every single time you come. You know, I never pull into the parking lot that the building doesn't uh, shock me how uh, big it is, especially early in the morning when the sun's hitting it. It's really a beautiful building. Yeah, and the whole grounds is so large. I mean, I, I could not figure out what that place was doing, where it was. And so, uh, wow, just it, it's, it's amazing. We are, we are so fortunate to have that in this part of the country. Yeah, agreed. So before we go, uh, we've talked about your book series. I would like to hear a little bit more about it, especially for folks who are interested and maybe they want to they want to dive in and start with book one. Tell us a little bit um, about the the book series and what it's about and what it's called. Okay. I don't think we even said the name. <laughs> it's called the Enchanted Bell Tower. Um, that's the the name of the series, and it's about two brothers, um, David and Jonathan, and. Uh, of course, their names are from the Bible, two, two best friends from the Bible, and their mom has recently passed away. So the, the first book deals a lot with grief and for kids who are going through really, really hard times. So grief and then moving because they were living in the St. Louis area. Their dad moves them to Dexter, which was their mom's home church growing up, and they end up moving into the church building. So all of this then takes place in the church building that my wife and I were married in and, and our kids were were dedicated in and one was baptized in. And in that church building, the brothers live and they end up discovering that their mom's Bible is the key to going into the bell tower and being transported into the stories of the Bible. So every book is, involves the boys getting sent into one or more, usually more stories of the Bible and their encounters with the biblical characters and with God and sometimes directly with Jesus in, uh, in those stories helps them deal with problems that they're facing in their life out in the real world. So there's there's always this dual thing going on. They're facing some sort of problem in 
their lives in Dexter in 21st century America. And they go into the stories of the Bible and what they learn there help them deal with their, their struggles in daily life. Is there a particular target audience age-wise, or is it just whoever likes to read? Well, there is a target age. I have written it for what's called a middle grade age audience, which means like third graders up through eighth graders. However, I have found that adults, particularly of my age and above, also really enjoy them. It, the books are trying to help make the stories of the Bible relevant to people's lives. And so I think once you reach at least third grade, anyone can read this and, and get that out of them. For adults, though, I mean, they're quick reads. It's like you'll be able to read any one of the books, except for the fourth book in probably an hour. The fourth book might take a couple of hours because it's by far the longest. But they're they're not long, and they try, like I said, just to make the stories of the Bible um, new. Not not really new, but just make them relevant to, to life. Maybe help people see them anew. And, Who and did your they, uh, cover art? That is... I really need to find the answer to that question. It's someone that I found on the website Fiverr. So Susan and I came up with the concept. We actually drew this out and almost exactly like what it looks like. We drew it out and we found an artist, a book cover artist on Fiverr and said, can you turn this into um, a book cover for us? And the person said, sure. And using just stock photo art kind of stuff, they stock art stuff, they turned it into that cover. Well, it looks great. It's a great looking book. I read a little bit um, of the marketing behind it, and uh, I'm definitely going to get some copies. So um, kudos for the great work you're doing on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, And thank you for being and spending just a little bit of time with us this morning here at Discovery Park of America, especially since I know you're a member. I'm going to have to play that up. Famous author (laughs) is also a member of Discovery Park. Well, I hope someday I'll be a famous author. <laughs> right now, I'm just an author. <laughs> hey, you're you're famous enough to be on uh, Real Foot Forward. So, you know, what more can you want, right? That's right. I'm I'm enjoying life. I'm having a great time. I'll tell you what, doing doing what you love doing is nothing better. And I love writing these stories. That's great. Well, thank you to all of you listeners who've joined us today at Discovery Park of America. Our mission here is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. To plan an experience here for you and your family, visit discoveryparkofamerica.com.